1942's one yes. Oscar. 1941. Sorry, yeah. 1941. Yeah. I always get the Oscar award ceremony and the year it is. They're always a year off. You are to be in pictures. You're wonderful to see. You are to be in pictures. Oh, what a hit you would be. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is James, joined as ever by my friend Steve, and this is Every Best Picture, where we are going through all of the Academy Award winning films for Best Picture from the very first year right up to the present. This episode, it's 1941's How Green Was My Valley. Before we set it off, though, if you haven't already subscribed, it'd be a great favor to us if you did. And just as a reminder, deep dive movie reviews, we do do spoilers. So... But James, this is from what, 1942? 1941? Yeah, 941. Yeah, spoilers. I don't think spoilers is going to be an issue here. No, not really. Not really. Okay, so directed by John Ford, uh, based on the novel by Richard Llewellyn. This is the story of a small Welsh mining town, coal mining town, and the... Uh, you know, the trials and tribulations that hit the community uh, in the Victorian era, uh, basically as modernization is taking place. And I'm going to be talking with a Welsh accent through some of this. I do apologize. Other mines in other areas are closing and that causes, you know, more workers to come in. So fewer jobs for the locals and other various family dramas take place uh, in and around the coal mine. I'd never seen this film before, James. Uh, this is one of the, you know, every best pictures that is new to my palette. Uh, it's one that I've always wanted to see. It's a John Ford film. It's been on the radar. I just had never seen it. And uh, I'll start off by saying to our audience, I'll let James, the Brit, do the Welsh accent as the American. It always ends up becoming Indian in the end whenever I try one of those accents. Oof, and you don't so, want to go well, there. Yeah. No. You know what I thought was interesting was right at the beginning, seeing a young Roddy McDowell playing yeah. the young protagonist and somebody who has followed Roddy McDowell his whole career, who remembers him from Planet of the Apes when he was playing the young Cornelius, all the way to playing Peter Vincent in Fright Night. You know, I've just always been a Roddy McDowell fan. He's he starred in probably one of the, the epic uh, episodes of Rod Serling's Night Gallery which uh, always that the, the one where he's in the painting and it keeps getting closer, the, the demon keeps getting closer. And it's just one of the scariest episodes of Night Gallery. It's a, it's a Roddy McDowell classic. But to see him as a young boy in this film as the protagonist was a, was a welcome surprise because I did not know he was in the film. I hadn't seen this before either, um, yeah. but I, I was aware that this was like his first role or something like that. I didn't realize how important a role is it. He narrates mm -hmm. the movie, or rather, his character. That's it. He is the main protagonist. You mm -hmm. know, he is the, the he's the, the point of view. The... You know, mm -hmm. we see the we see the story as a um, you know a nostalgic reflection from his character. Many, many, many years yeah. later, he is the youngest member of this big family with like five sons and a daughter and 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 all the rest of it. He he's a pretty passive member of that community for a long time in the movie. He's quite literally passive after he mm -hmm. falls in a you know in a cold stream during the winter yeah, and yeah. is then bedridden for like half the movie. Now going into this, I mean, yes, it's John Ford, and you know, so you expect a certain degree of quality. But for me, this movie was always sort of most famous or infamous really for being the movie that beat Citizen Kane to best picture that yes. year. Not only did it beat Citizen Kane, it also beat the Maltese Falcon, Falcon. and yeah. here comes Mr. Jordan and Sergeant yeah. York. You know, it was it was not the movie from this year that it, that has been sort of best remembered by by any stretch. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. so actually I was pleasantly surprised that it's actually pretty good. You know, it's mm -hmm. a perfectly sort of solid decent yes. bit of melodrama yeah. i couldn't help but watch this movie thinking what was it about this movie that was quote unquote better than um citizen kane and and the other nominees you know what was it about this movie that resonated with a 1940s uh audience and voting body in a way that those others didn't there's suggestions that it's kind of like an immigrant story that, uh, you know, at one point, some of the boys talk about how they're going to move to uh, Canada or they're going to move to America. And so you get the opinion that, OK, fine. So for maybe for like a generation of Americans, uh, this and stories similar to this feel like they're they're roots you know that you know this is this is what my father my fathers and my father's fathers went through my forefathers that's the word i was looking for um 
So I thought, well, maybe there's an element of that to this story. Mm -hmm. Although I'm not sure how many Welshmen actually sort of went over the Atlantic, but probably a fair few. Um, and I was wondering also whether there was any kind of allegory that we were supposed to draw from particularly the miners' strike um, mm -hmm. towards Americans getting into World War II, because that would have all, all been happening sort of at the time. And I, so I, was, I wasn't sure, and I'm still not convinced after mm -hmm. having seen it that there was something there, but I was like, is there a parallel to be drawn here between the community, um, you know, sort of defiantly refusing to do something or to step over a certain line to commit to get involved in certain like certain this about sort of um industrial action, and you know the discussion going on in America at that time about should we get involved in the war or should we right. stay out of it, and um and I think I think it's there if you look for it, it's there if you want it yeah. to be there. I think there's an argument to yeah. be made. Like de deconstructing any art, you'll find it if you go looking for it. <laughs> if you go looking for it, you can find it for sure, for sure. But I mean, how did it's you it. feel? I mean, why, why did this yeah. film win? Um, I, I thought it was epic in scope, not unlike Cimarron. I thought there was elements of Cimarron in it. it, it the scope wasn't quite as grand uh, as as Cimarron, but it really was. Was I think people are very interested in communities transforming, and this is what this film does. It it reminds us. I think we're all suckers as humans for nostalgia, and this is a nostalgia piece. This is a person looking back on a time where things were better, things were greener, things were cleaner, things made sense. It's not unlike a lot of what we're seeing in the world today. We look back at times gone past and things seem to make sense. There was order to the universe. There was, yeah, there was trials, but families got along and communities got along. And now we're seeing polarization. We're seeing, and this, I think this is kind of a, a pattern that happens in humanity. So I think films like this that remind us things did used to be better. I, I think sometimes that's an illusion. I, I think that's well, the we, things are going to be often, better. it's pretty rose tinted. I'm, I'm actually an optimist looking forward despite the challenges, but I still think there's a nostalgia factor that even I uh, I respond well to. And so I, I thought that that was probably, especially in a wartime, when people are in wartime and they're going through a lot of turmoil and they, at this point, they didn't know which way the war was going to go. Mm -hmm. Thinking back to the time when the Valley was green sure seemed appealing, probably in 1942. Sure. Well, I mean, this was 1941, right? So probably made in 1940. Mm -hmm. So it's so the Americans aren't necessarily in the war yet. In a vault, yeah. When, Maybe when should we strike or shouldn't we strike? <laughs> well, that's that's my point. <laughs> there's exactly. your, there's your, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. You're, I was kind of coming. I was playing off your uh, your your uh, suggestion there, but um, I think uh, by and large, I thought this film was quite good. It was very solid. I loved watching Walter Pigeon play playing the Reverend, kind of this voice of reason. One of the struggles I had with it though was. It seemed to develop in ways that were just not normative or the way that you would expect them to go with the Maureen O'Hara character falling into a loveless marriage with the minor son, much to the chagrin of everybody who realizes she's supposed to be with the with the reverend, but the reverend mm. is just too poor and is not going to condemn her to a life of of that. And and so the whole thing where she goes off with the husband and, and then comes back by herself and there's gossip and I'm not suggesting that couldn't happen or it was any way unreal. If anything, it was too real. When I go to a film, I don't want that much reality. I want, I want either, I, I either want bitter, like a something really bad happened or something really good happened. It's just kind of in the middle. And there were there was elements of resolution of different elements in this film that were just kind of right down the middle. And so I was left unfulfilled at times. Well, does that not reflect sort of the small town community where it is always a storm in the t in a teacup, if if you like, yeah. you know, you know, it does flip the entire community when something that's actually not all that serious happens. Mm -hmm. um, I do, I do agree with you to a point. I did yeah. feel that there was something dramatically lacking in mm -hmm. that part of the Maureen O'Hara story. I mean, I love the kind of the tragedy of the fact that she's clearly, you know, clearly she should be with Mr. Glyphith, yeah. uh, Walter Pigeon's and, character. And again, if you're going to go that route, then really lean into it and go mm. there rather than bringing her back. Uh, and they never really quite explain it. 
No, I, I mean, I and the character, remember. I mean, the husband, yeah. um, it, he's a bit of a non-entity. He literally shows up for five minutes, marries her and yeah. whisks her off. And then yeah. he doesn't really show up again. Yeah, like and... treat her badly or something. Like either yeah. either go into this tragedy or bring it back and have this love resolve. But when it was kind of, you know, it's Mr. Miyagi. You go down one, one side of the road, safe. You go down the other side of the road, safe. You go down the middle, squish. And I felt there was elements in this film that I would have liked either this or this. Don't give me 50-50. Don't give me lukewarm. Give me hot or cold. I wonder whether it's another of those situations where it's developed more fully in the book, but in the movie, they, you know, they kind of didn't have enough time left, if you like, to develop it. Right. It does, it doesn't happen until fairly late on. But I did think because it, the relation, the potential for relationship between her and Walter Pigeon is set up so early on uh, that you do feel somewhat shortchanged when. You know, you understand why she's made this choice, but when the character to whom she does go off and marry is such a non-entity, he's such a non-character. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's hard; he hardly features at all, and then he's kind of sort of written out uh, almost mm -hmm. as soon as he's been written in. And you're like, okay, well, yeah, I, I feel that. Yes, yeah. you haven't you haven't satisfied me on an emotional level here. Yes, because she is also so sympathetic as a character. You know, she's absolutely gorgeous, mm -hmm. Maureen O'Hara, you know, absolutely brilliant well, actress. Yeah. Yeah. And you're instantly on her side, and throughout, you're rooting for them as a couple. Uh, and mm -hmm. then it's it's all kind of destroyed by by his almost unseen forces. But who knows? Maybe you could. There's an allegorical element to that as well. I did just look, check it out actually, and. I think the war might have had more to do with it than we're even suggesting because How Green Was My Valley premiered in New York City in October 1941. Oh, wow. Okay. So, you know, weeks so, before weeks. Pearl Harbor and then would have, you know, the Oscars would have been the following sort of January, February or whatever when they've just right. fresh into the war. So maybe, you know, that was very much on people's minds. Yes, this this yes. kind of sort of decision about, you know, they had been humming and hawing about whether or not to get involved. And this was, you know, literally in the interim, as this movie was opening, you know, Pearl Harbor happens and they have no choice. They've got to get stuck in. Yeah. Maybe that Winston did have Churchill to was making his shuttle trips over to visit Roosevelt, trying to get him in the war, get him in the war. And then uh, the Japanese. There you go. Did Pearl there Harbor and. Uh, I mean, you can totally see why why John Ford made this movie because I mean, right from like minute one almost, I was like, oh well, this is a western, you know. By any yeah. other name, this is you know a uh, yeah, a, yeah a frontier drama, really, you know. So it's interesting that you you flagged up Cimarron because it feel absolutely feels like that, you know. This is a, a tight knit oh, community, a big family, but that's they're all that they have, and they are a microcosm of society. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and all around them is sort of the great outdoors where they are at the mercy of the elements, you know, whether they're burrowing into the ground or they're falling into freezing streams or what have you. And I was like, OK, yeah, yeah, this is uh, this is yeah, yeah. this is well within John Ford's wheelhouse, even if it doesn't seem to be on the surface. Whenever I think of John Ford, I think of more of the 1950s, maybe late 40s. Uh, is this fairly early in his career? Because I'm trying to think how much John Ford there was before this film. Is this oh a fair amount? I mean, fairly... he was making he was making silent westerns. Um, okay, okay, yeah. Well, I mean, let's yeah, have you, a quick. You, you filled in a blank for me there because I I meant to look that up, and I'm thinking, is this still pretty early in his development as a director, or is he pretty seasoned at this point? Because, like I said, when I think of John Ford, I think more of the fifties. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, they were really sort of the, the last hurrah, if you like. I mean, he was making his first directorial credit is in 1917. So he was making oh. sort of silent shorts and even was I off. OK. And even silent features like way back in the teens. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah. So by the time uh, of of this in what, 1941, he had already done The Grapes of Wrath and Young Mr. Lincoln, the Stagecoach. Mm -hmm uh and and the likes of that and although yeah sort of you were still to get my darling clementine and ford apache and obviously the searches and things like that that was very much kind of towards the end it's it's yeah. kind of sort of yeah. reloaded if you like with mm -hmm. the ones that you know but oh yeah he's been he'd been going for a very long time already so in terms of like okay. john ford and the oscars this this was his third of four best director oscars mm -hmm. so he was already sort of well established in that realm as well you know he won in 1936 for the informer and he was nominated again for stagecoach and then he won for grapes of wrath just the previous year so 
this was two in a row for him, which in a way, I guess, makes it even more of a surprise, really. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's so rare for directors to to re repeat win, mm -hmm. you know, year on year, just because, I mean, especially these days where it's hard enough for them, you to make a, a movie and turn it around within a year. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you have a, a movie two years in a row in contention at all mm -hmm. is, a, is a, a rare feat these days. But yeah, but back then, you know, so he was... He was very much, you know, firing on all cylinders. Mm -hmm. And I think it shows. I mean, this is the one thing that I want to reiterate about this movie is it was much better than I was anticipating. You know, yeah, I really yeah. thought that this was kind of like a minor work and it was sort of the green book of its day or something. You know, it was a movie mm -hmm. that, you know, shouldn't shouldn't yeah. have won. But yeah. I, I don't necessarily believe that that is true. Having now seen it, I'm like, yeah, it's perfectly it's perfectly yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, solid, rock solid movie. <laughs> Well, you know, it's it's interesting when we were talking uh, a couple of reviews back on why some certain films develop a certain zeitgeist beyond the maybe the awards that it's won. And we we referenced uh, L.A. Confidential, which mm. I remember being pretty much my favorite movie of, I think, about 1998. And although it's a perfectly respectable movie and I love it and I can recommend it, you just don't hear people talking about it in the same way. And during this Academy Awards season, it's similar. I had watched Maltese Falcon, Humphrey Bogart, a number of times. Um, I had not seen Citizen Kane for reasons that I, I gave when we did the review, but I was totally aware of Citizen Kane and, and, and of the reputation it had. I could not have told you this year what, you know, who would have won, let alone what, how green my, was my Valley was even about. I didn't know what it was. Right. I didn't know nothing about it. So even though I watched it and I agree with you that it definitely exceeded my expectations, One's left to wonder why years and years later, decades later, the the films that didn't win are the ones that are endeared into many film goers' hearts and not this one. Yeah, I think that is a strange one. And I think it might have something to do with the fact that it's not a Western. You know, that it's it's mm -hmm. one of John Ford's sort of other movies. And he will he's so you know, it's it's so sort of seared into the public Known conscious. The, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, you know, John Ford yeah. is a Western, that anything else that he did is just kind of sort of fallen by the wayside, even if it's something that he won the Oscar for. But uh, yeah, just to reiterate what it was up against that year in terms of best picture, there were actually uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There were 10 nominees because they do go back and forth over the years about how many nominees right. there will be uh and and to this day i mean even in the last decade we've seen it sort of wobble about and go back and forth but i think more is better i think i like 10 and there were 10 mm -hmm. that year and they include i'm not going to reel off all of them but they include citizen kane here comes mr jordan sergeant york suspicion <gasps> the the alfred hitchcock movie and the maltese falcon Sergeant York was the other one that I mean that's Sergeant York I remember watching with my dad at least a couple times as a kid and my dad loving Sergeant York I mean I I developed a love for Sergeant York through my watching it with my father well I I must confess I'm not sure that I've seen it actually but I know mm -hmm. Gary Cooper did win best actor he beat out yeah. uh Humphrey Bogart for Morty's Fog and he beat out Orson Welles for mm -hmm. Citizen Kane for that yeah. um you know they really they really didn't want to give Citizen Kane anything but and, and so that's why I do <laughs> I do wonder whether yeah. you know how much Hurst was in the background pulling the strings going yeah. you know don't don't award that that little that little guy and, and it also makes you wonder too is 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 much as I think it deserves many of the accolades it has, I'm not sure mm. it de de deserves all the accolades that it has received over the years, but it makes you wonder if the natural pushback of the community after realizing somebody like William Randolph Hearst might have instrumented or been instrumental in a kind of a, a, a boycott, maybe that's too strong of a word, of Citizen Kane, that the community rallied over the years and kind of, you know, like we were saying earlier about another film uh, here in Asia that has been kind of censored out, but the very act of censoring out ends up putting it on everybody's radar. Yeah. And I wonder how much Citizen Kane was put on the radar of many filmmakers once they realized possibly what was uh, being done to it. Well, yeah, I mean, as we touched on in, in our Citizen Kane episode, I think, you know, it was pushed out of theatres. It didn't really get, it didn't really find an audience for about a decade. Uh, you know, and it's not like today, whereas if you hear about something, you can go find it online. 
uh, right, you know, back then right. you you couldn't. And so at the time, I think there was probably an element of pressure from, you know, Hearst and his people. There was also, I think, the old guard feeling threatened by this young punk who had his new, his ways, you know, coming <laughs> over from the East Coast with his theatre troupe and breaking all the rules to make this movie. That's right. And I, and I think, you know, quite often these movies that are kind of seen as quote unquote ahead of their time, that phrase by its very nature means it's not recognized until later that, oh yeah, yeah, right. this was great. And I, I compared it to like um, Tarantino's Pulp Fiction in that way yeah. that, you know, it wasn't really till later that everyone was like, oh, that's the impact that that movie has had. You didn't see it until, until it was in hindsight. Um, so I think there is sort of an element in all, of all of that. Suffice to say that I, I feel slightly uh, better about that. You know, I, I still think that, you know, Citizen Kane or one of the other films in contention probably should have won. But I feel slightly more OK with the fact that How Green Was My Valley won mm -hmm. now that now that I've seen it. Um, well, that pretty much know, answers as we go into does this film stand the test of time? You know, is it um, is it does it? deserve its place in Oscar history, you're suggesting that it does. I, I am suggesting that it does. You know, that the stink on it is kind of um, sort of uh, unearned, you know, is, is mm -hmm. unjustified somewhat. Uh, I think it probably does deserve sort of re-evaluation. It's, you know, it's so slickly um, directed. You know, the, the, I, mm -hmm. I want, the cinematography is, is gorgeous in it and the sets because they did shoot on on sets for the most part yes, and the yeah. map paintings and everything i'm a big sucker for for those sort of old style set movies and <laughs> aided by the black and white photography which i think it lends it sort of a bit more authenticity you know in color you yeah, can see yeah. how how fake some stuff is sometimes you know with the, particularly with right. the painted backgrounds which i love but they're very much an artifice you know with the black and white kind of sort of hides some of the cracks if you mm -hmm. like and I, yeah, I just, yeah. I just felt that it was, uh, it had a great sort of sense of pace, place, and community. I thought the sequences in the mine shafts were done really, really well. There was a yeah. real palpable sense of claustrophobia. You know, the drama of those sequences mm -hmm. where the, the, the mine lift, the lift is coming up through the shaft, and it's like, will there be people on the, this time, or won't yeah, there be yeah. people on it? You know, when it comes up empty, and that just means there's no one else left down there. Yeah, you know yeah that that's a that's a master of the craft that that is pure forward you know being able yeah. to you know wring that kind of emotion out of something so straightforward so yeah i agree with you i think this does stand the test of time like yourself the ex expectations were exceeded and in addition to those high drama moments i love just some of the the dialogue and interaction even when they're talking labor issues when the brothers go to get their pay but they were going going yeah. to give them their final payout but we're going to replace you with cheaper younger guys and you know this is something we see all as somebody who's 56 years old not that it's happened to me personally but i've i've seen it happen to others where they get you know why why pay this amount for you when i can get somebody 20 years younger than you that's willing to work for this and eh, sure they're not as an experience they're not as experienced but um you know, we're, we're, we're counting our dimes, nickels and dimes now. We got to go this way. And and for me, it's just a reminder that these types of issues are timeless. The, the, the issues that were going on in 1941-42 are no different in many ways than the way we're dealing with things today. And so uh, it's, it's wonderful to watch a film like this and be reminded that, yes, we're disconnected in many areas of, of time and culture and place, but in other areas it's the same sun that we're all under and the same things keep repeating. And uh, this film was a pleasant reminder of it. And I thought John Ford did a wonderful job. Well, that's our thought on how green was my Valley. We think it stands the test of time. What about you? Do you think it should, or eh, what about citizen Kane, Sergeant York, Maltese Falcon, Maltese Falcon was a personal favorite of mine. But what about you? We look forward to hearing from you, James. Absolutely. You know, let us know about your favorite John Ford movies, especially. I mean, we we love the Westerns, but especially some of his other non-Westerns that you think are well worth a look. We'd love to hear about those as well. Until next episode. Bye-bye.